Hello. Good to see you. Pastor Sam with a devotion. Ah, I forgot to close my blinds. Hold on a sec. Whew. Crisis averted. Pastor Sam with a devotion for October 20th. I'm at home uh, feeling not bad, but just a little bit of tickle in my throat. So spending a little bit of time at home, this may not have my usual enthusiasm that you've grown accustomed to. And I also don't have my hymnal. So we're going to kind of make this up as we go, which is what I normally do. So maybe it'll be fine. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. You'll probably hear my loving family running around in the background at some point. They may come by and say hello. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, we are keeping most things uh, the same. And so Deuteronomy 19, 1 through 20, it's for you to read. It's about, there's this idea, oh, I can position my glasses to make exactly, this is the most annoying thing in the world. There, I have to be nice and tall. Cities of refuge. There's this idea that if uh, someone should accidentally kill someone, it actually gives an example. They're out chopping wood and the axe handle flies off and hits the other person in the head and kills them accidental death, that there are these cities where the killer, not murderer, but killer can go to be able to live a peaceful life still. And then also laws about witnesses for different crimes. And so it's just, again, like we said a few times ago, the Church of Israel uh, for back then was also the nation of Israel. And so there's a lot of kind of national laws that go alongside with the worshiping laws. And this is another example of that thing. We're going to hear Matthew 15, 1 through 20. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, What you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Leave them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Hear you the word of the Lord, as it is written. Eating with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. There we go. We have settled definitively whether or not all children must wash before they eat. The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, says no. Well, uh, that's a true statement, but that's not quite the point. <laughs> Just kind of a humorous aside. You should still wash your hands. I mean, that's not the point of this text. The point of this text is... There's there's some been something of ah I have a special guest coming my way. I have I have two special guests. We have never before 
Girls, do you want to say hi? Hi! Anna just lost this other tooth this morning, so she is uh, she is able to sing that classic song hi. about Christmas. And my sweet little Julia. Yep. Now, there's this... growing teeth. Julia is growing teeth. There's this sort of um, tension at play between the Pharisees and Jesus. And Jesus is sort of driving at it in different ways throughout his ministry. And one of the ways that he's talking about it now is the the commandments of God versus the traditions of men. And not to use my daughter's head, I just had to put it on two sides. Now, what the Pharisees do, and what makes this so darn sinister, is... Hear, hear what the tradition of men sounds like. Um, okay, so you, you would be telling, this is verse uh, 5, you would be saying this to your mother or your father. What you would have gained from me is given to God. So basically what they're saying is, uh, there, there's this kind of understanding that as parents age and become like elderly, that then the children sort of reverse the relationship. Instead of parent raising and caring for children, children in turn care for their parents. And some of you may be experiencing that uh, on one end of that or the other, either caring for an elderly parent or experiencing the reversal of the relationship where you are no longer mothering or fathering your children, but they're taking care of you. Now, what, what, what makes this so sinister is, so imagine if you said, you know what, it takes a lot of my time and energy to care for you. Instead of caring for you, mom or dad, I'm going to use that time and energy to do something at church, right? So instead of buying you food, I'm going to give that money as an offering. Instead of coming to your house, uh, I don't know, a few times a week to do laundry and cook meals and that kind of stuff, I'm going to volunteer for this thing at church. Now, on the one hand, that seems like a very honorable and noble thing to do. Wow, you are uh, really helping out the Lord. You are doing a great service to the Lord. And, and you are, but that, again, that's not quite the point. What you're doing is, and, and what makes this so devious is that facetious you, not you, you, you are... I just had a word. <laughs> I lost it. Uh, dishonoring. That wasn't the word I had. Uh, you are dishonoring your parents. Forsaking. You are forsaking the parents God has given to you, to, to you specifically, to do something for God that any number of people could do. And that's that's really not, well, I guess that is one of the issues at play. Let me say that. Is that you have this very special relationship, especially within your family. There are a very small number of people in your family who, who are able to take care of these different people versus if you consider a congregation like Faith, there's quite a few different people who are able to do these different things. Now, you can fall off the horse on the other side, so don't hear me say never volunteer at church, um, but, but you need to be nurturing and supporting the relationships that God has given you. And now what, what I suspect happened in our reading is that over time, the Pharisees had made these traditions. Jesus calls them traditions. And over time, one of them was, you know what? It seems much holier, I'll use that word, much holier to give an offering to God than it is to like buy groceries for your aging parents, right? That seems much holier to, to give money to God. And, and giving money to God, again, that's not a bad thing, and it's not a good thing. I think I said it last time, it's this idea of better or worse, right? Better or worse. But what the Pharisees had done was set up this very rigid structure of here's what you have to do. And Jesus is trying to show them the result of this structure. Okay, so what does he say? If anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. 
So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. One of the things that God's word does is ensure that things are, God's commandments specifically, is ensure that things are working the way they're designed. So the family unit, this should not be surprising. God has designed the family unit in such a way with, with noisy babs running all over. God has designed the family unit. Guys, off the chair, please. In such a way that when you listen to what he says, it's going to work well, right? So like having a mother and a father present and raising children is going to raise better children than either one of them on their own. What a surprise. When we do things the way that God's designed, they tend to work out. That's a shocker, isn't it? But what had happened is the Pharisees had been kind of concocting these holy sounding traditions that that were were kind of chipping away at how God had designed things to work. And so they they'd been sort of driving I'm using a bunch of metaphors. I'm just I'm I'm tired and I'm sloppy, so I'm not apologizing. I'm just saying that. They they've been chipping away and inserting these traditions into God's word. And so it was this weird sort of Frankenstein where it was kind of God's word the way he's designed it and kind of how we think things ought to be and it just wasn't working out right it wasn't working and Jesus is trying to reveal this not just to the Pharisees but to the whole crowds right like guys come on do stuff the way God designed let's let's not be inserting these things that we think we know how it works best because we don't right let's just do things the way that God designed them to be now the other another issue that's at play in our text is again this idea of um, one of the traditions that grew over time were what like like kosher which is still a thing today in the Jewish community uh, keeping kosher, being kosher, right? There's kosher salt and kosher meals. I don't know who rides on airplanes anymore, but I guess if someone does, there's still kosher meals. There was this very rigid structure. Certain foods were permitted and could be eaten, and other foods were... <sighs> I missed the word again. Unclean. That's it. Unclean. Unclean. Certain foods were unclean. Man, it's messing with my brain. And and should not be eaten. And But Jesus is kind of being like, hey guys, uh, that's no longer the case. And he actually does say that. I think it's most clear in Mark. There, there's parallel accounts, I think, in Mark and Luke to this reading here. And in Mark, uh, it's either Mark or Luke, they basically say, in doing this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Because cause this, or maybe it's John even. I don't, anyway. Because this was like a big deal, right? Wow, this system we have for these foods are good and these foods are unclean. It, it Jesus is like doing away with this whole big thing. And, and it's part of our identity. So this is like a weird thing to have to give up. But Jesus is not so concerned about the things that go into your body, because he's kind of talking, first of all, at, at, at an anatomical level, right? The stuff that goes in your mouth goes down into your stomach, and then it goes out into the toilet and the sewer, and it's like gone. So why would that make you unclean, Jesus says. But the things that come out of you and now here again, here's where he's pointing to people. The things that are in your heart, you either have, I'm going to say it and then I'll say what I mean by that. You either have a good heart, and so good things are coming out of your mouth, or you have an evil heart, and so evil things are coming out of your mouth. And Jesus has spoken that way using, again, uh, a plant analogy, right? The good tree produces good fruit. Um, I think it was Matthew 12. He says this. I could be wrong, though. Uh, the bad tree produces bad fruit. So the, the good mouth says good things, and the wicked mouth says wicked things. 
Jesus is taking it a step farther, saying that, no, the food that goes in your mouth has nothing to do with being clean or unclean, being sinful or sinless. Right? It's the things that come out of your mouth, which are a reflection of, I'm pointing to my heart, you can't see that, which are a reflection of your heart. That is what, that, that is either sinful or not. Right? Those things that come out of you, those thoughts, which don't specifically come out of you. Thoughts are immaterial. But words and actions do come out of you and reveal what sort of person you are. The wicked person with wicked heart does wicked things, says wicked things. The good person with good heart says good things, does good things. Now, this is not always always and forever. Well, no. So let me say that. That's how it is. Now, I think I said this last time or the time before, your definition of good or bad is, is meaningless, totally meaningless. It's God's definition of good and bad that we have to use. And good is anything done through faith in Christ, right? So the stuff that I do, I have to be a little bit careful because I still do sin, but my sins are forgiven for the sake of Jesus Christ. So when God sees me, he doesn't see a sinful person, even though I am plenty sinful. He sees a good person, a righteous person, because I have Jesus' righteousness. As opposed to someone who has no faith in Jesus, who may do good-looking, good-appearing, philanthropic things, but it's utter evil. It's, it's nothing but wickedness in the sight of God because it's done apart from faith in Jesus Christ. And God doesn't give two rips what you think good is. He could care less about your definition of good because he's already got his own definition of good. <laughs> and he seems to think he knows better than you. What a shocker that God would have the audacity to think that he knows better than you. What a God. Uh, but he does. <laughs> and he knows better than me. He doesn't care what I think good or evil is. He's already got his own definition of good and evil. And I think he's going to be using that for quite some time. So he's not open to suggestions as far as that's concerned. Let me coyly say that, right? He's not looking... Uh, he doesn't have a, a box where you can drop suggestions about this should be good or this should be evil. He's got that one pretty much uh, nailed down. I guess I become even sassier when I'm feeling not so good. So there we go. We've answered that question. But anyway, Jesus is pointing people away from the traditions that have been built up over time. That's the point. I should come back to the point. And two, what they've had all along, the word of God, the things that God has said. Because those things aren't going to change. When God says something, that's just how it is. When he says something is good, you take that straight to the bank. It's good for all time. When he says things are bad, take it to the bank. They're bad for all time. Now, in light of my devotion from either last time or the time before, there are, there are sometimes different ways to understand what he said, right? We don't kill people. I, I don't don't remember if that was last time or the one before, right? But we don't go out murdering people. We instead sever relationships. So we still have the same way to understand God's word and achieve the same result, but through a different means. So, so sometimes there's a little bit different means. But when God says a certain thing, like, hey, get rid of people who are telling you to come away from me, then, then we get rid of them in, in our own contextual way. There we go. I feel like I've left a horrible trail of breadcrumbs all the way along here. And hopefully you understand what I mean. Here, I have a special guest to help me wrap everything up because I'm just out of thoughts. <laughs> so we're going to pray. We're going to try to say the Lord's Prayer, and hopefully I do it well on camera. But let's go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I will see you next time. Hopefully Bye. I feel better. I'm not bad. I just have a little bit of tickle and tiredness in me. So. Bye-bye. Yeah, Anna said it. Bye-bye. God's peace. See you next time.